My story? Well, it will take time, but if you wish it, I cannot gracefully refuse. At, at about a hundred paces from Verdome, on the banks of the Loire, stands an old brown house, crowned with very high roofs and so completely isolated that there is nothing near it. In front of this house is a garden down to the river. That is, it once was a garden. Now it is completely overrun with weeds, and the trees and shrubs have grown wild and ugly. The paths once graveled are overgrown with purslane. But to be accurate, there's really no longer a trace of a path unless you look very closely. At one time, this must have been a beautiful garden, setting off the house until it very probably looked like a castle. The roof of this house is dreadfully dilapidated, and the outside shutters are always closed. The balconies are hung with swallows' nests, and the doors are forever shut. And the dreary silence is broken only by birds and cats, rats and mice, free to scamper around and fight and eat each other. An invisible hand has written over it all, mystery. During my stay at Verdun, the sight of La Grande Bretèche, for that's what it was called, became one of my keenest pleasures. Its unrevealed secrets intrigued me. And many was the evening that I braved the scratches of the overgrown hedges and got into this ownerless garden, which was no longer public or private. I lingered there for hours, gazing at the disorder and wondering at the debauches which had brought its downfall. One evening in my room, a stranger was announced to me, a Monsieur Regnault, who was the essence of politeness, but who had the great displeasure, he said, to request that my visits to La Grande Bretèche cease. Naturally, I was curious as to why, and he elaborated by adding that he was the executor under the will of the late Comtesse de Marais, and that her last word had specifically instructed that the house was to be vacated, and no one was to enter, even the grounds, for fifty years. Well, more than ever, I wanted to know why such a strange will was left. Monsieur was a tacit man, but a glass of sherry warmed him sufficiently to relate that Monsieur le Comte de Marais was dead, and that Madame de Marais was on her deathbed when he visited La Grande Bretèche. She was a shrunken old woman who gave her last will and testament the moment before she clutched a very beautiful silver-mounted Spanish crucifix and died. From that time on, no one had entered the house, not even the madame's maid. In such a state of suspense, Monsieur Regnault left me. I, burning with desire to know the whole story could think of no better person to tell it to me than the maid, who, I was surprised, was easily found, and after some bribing and a great deal of talking, was willing to relate what she knew of the story. Rosalie was eloquent in her reproduction, and in order not to fill volumes, I will relate what she told me as briefly as possible. The room at La Grande Bretèche in which Madame de Marais slept was on the ground floor. A little cupboard in the wall, about four feet deep, served to hang her dresses in. Three months before the evening of which I have to relate the events, Madame de Marais was been, had been seriously ailing, so much so that her husband had left her to herself and had his own bedroom on the second floor. By one of those accidents which it is impossible to foresee, he came in that evening, two hours later than usual from the club, where he went to read the papers. For some time past, Monsieur de Marais had been satisfied to ask Rosalie whether his wife was in bed. And on the girls replying always in the affirmative, he at once went to his own room with the good faith that comes from habit and confidence. But this evening, and coming in, he took it into his head to go see Madame de Marais. Instead of calling Rosalie, who was in the kitchen at that moment, Monsieur de Marais made his way to his wife's room by the light of his lantern. At the instant when he turned the key to enter his wife's room, he fancied he heard the door shut of the closet of which I have spoken. But when he went in... Madame de Marais was alone, standing in front of the fireplace. The unsuspecting husband fancied that Rosalie was in the cupboard. Nevertheless, a doubt ringing in his ears like the peal of bells put him on his guard. He looked at his wife, read in her eyes an indescribably anxious and haunted expression. You are very late, she said. Her voice, usually so clear and sweet, struck him as being slightly husky. At this moment, Rosalie came into the room. This was like a thunderclap. He walked up and down the room, going from one window to another at a regular pace, his arms folded. Finally, facing his wife, he said, Madam, there is someone in your cupboard. 
She looked at him calmly and replied quite simply, No, monsieur. This no wrung Monsieur de Marais' heart. He did not believe it, and yet his wife had never appeared purer or more saintly than she seemed at this moment. He rose to go and open that closet door. Madame took his hand, stopped him, looked at him sadly, and said in a voice of strange emotion, Remember, if you should find no one there, everything must be at an end between you and me. Hmm. No, Josephine, I will not open it. In either event, we should be parted forever. Listen, I know all the purity of your soul. I know you lead a saintly life and would not commit a deadly sin to save your life. See, here is your crucifix. Swear to me before God that there is no one in there. I will believe you. I will never open that door. I swear it. Louder. And repeat. I swear before God that there is nobody in that closet. I swear before God that there is nobody in that closet. That will do. Now, Rosalie, I know that Goran Flaw wants to marry you. That poverty alone prevents your setting up house. And that you told him you would not be his wife till he found means to become a master mason. Well, go fetch him. And tell him to come here with his trowels and tools. His reward will be beyond your wishes. And above all, go out without saying a word or else. Rosalie left. Monsieur de Marais came quietly back to the fireside and began to tell her the details of the game of billiards and the discussion at the club that evening. When Rosalie returned, she found Monsieur and Madame de Marais conversing amiably. Gordon Flo is here, sir, said Rosalie. Uh, tell him to come in. Oh, go and flow. Go fetch some bricks from the coach house. Bring enough to wall up the door of this cupboard. You can use the plaster that is left for cement. Rosalie, said Madame de Marais, come and brush my hair. Her husband quietly walked up and down the room, keeping an eye on the door, on the mason who was bringing in the bricks, and on his wife, but without any insulting display of suspicion. Gorenflow could not help making some noise. Madame de Marais seized the moment when she was when he was unloading some bricks, and when her husband was at the other end of the room to say to Rosalie, My dear child, I will give you a thousand francs a year if you'll only tell Goran Flo to leave a crack at the bottom. And then she added aloud, quite coolly, You had better help him. Monsieur and Madame de Marais were silent all the time while Goran Flo was walling up the door. This silence was intentional on the husband's part. He did not wish to give his wife the opportunity of saying anything with a double meaning. On Madame de Marais' side, it was pride and prudence. When the wall was half built up, the cunning mason took advantage of his master's back being turned to break one of the two panes at the top of the door with his pick. By this, Madame de Marais understood that Rosalie had spoken to Gorenflo. They all three then saw the face of a dark, gloomy-looking man with black hair and flaming eyes, a Spaniard, a handsome Spaniard, before her husband turned around, the, the poor woman had nodded to the stranger to whom the signal was meant to convey hope. At four o'clock in the morning, as the day was dawning, the work was done. Monsieur de Marais slept in his wife's room. The next morning, when he got up, he said with apparent carelessness, Oh, by the way, I must go to the mayor for a passport. He put on his hat and left. Madame de Marais rang for Rosalie, and then in a terrible voice she cried, The pick! Bring the pick and set to work. I saw how Gordon Flo did it yesterday. We shall have time to make a gap and build it up again. In an instant, Rosalie had brought her mistress a sort of cleaver. She, with a vehemence in which no words can give an idea, set to work to demolish the wall. She had already got out a few bricks when, turning to deal a stronger blow than before, she saw behind her Monsieur de Marais. She fainted away. Lay Madame on her bed, said Monsieur de Marais. Foreseeing what would certainly happen in his absence, he had lain this trap for his wife. He had taken the beautiful silver-encrusted Spanish crucifix of his wife, which he had seen for the first time, and had asked questions until he shortly heard the name of its owner, a Spanish soldier in Verdome for the summer. Rosalie, you may serve my meals here in Madame's room. She is ill. I shall not leave her till she recovers. The cruel man remained in his wife's room for twenty days. During the earlier time, when there was some little noise in the closet and Josephine wanted to intercede for the dying man, 
He said, without allowing her to utter a word, Madam, you swore on the cross that there was no one there. And that, radio listeners, is one way of avoiding divorce. That was the story of La Grande Bretèche, or The Beautiful Castle, by the great French author Honoré de Balzac. Living from 1799 to 1850, Balzac can be considered one of the early pioneers of the short story, which, in the past century and a half, has come to monopolize so much of the modern printed word. A Somerset Maugham, in an introduction to a very recent collection of short stories entitled Tellers of Tales, makes the statement that from the first appearance of the short story, as we know it, around 1800, until today, there has been no improvement or polishing or sophistication. The first stories are, in other words, as good, as interesting, and as modern as the stories written today by acceptable authors. With Mr. Mom, I agree completely in this conclusion, and I believe La Grande Bretèche is one fine example proving that point. Incidentally, our American raconteur, Edgar Allan Poe, and across the sea contemporary of Balzac, wrote a story on the same theme and handled it in much the same manner. It is The Cask of Amontillado, and soon we shall present it in this series. Now, next week, we turn to Guy de Maupassant once again for one of his most subtly clever stories. Uh, be with us for The False Gems by de Maupassant. I can guarantee that you will like it. Until then, this is Nelson Armstead bidding you good night and good reading. <laughs>